The best way to play the road hole is to try to land your second shot short of the green and roll up, because if you hit the plateau on the fly, invariably you're gonna fly over, drop down into the road, and maybe even against up a rock wall that lines the far edge of the road. Hi, I'm Ron Witten, the architecture editor emeritus of Golf Digest magazine, digging deep into the profile of a single golf hole. Today it's the 17th hole at the old course at St. Andrews in St. Andrews, Scotland, one of the greatest and most difficult par fours in all golf. The hole starts with a blind tee shot over outbuildings of the Old Course Hotel to a fairway with an out of bounds along the right side. The second shot is into a diagonal green that set it off at an angle right up against a road protected by a tiny pot bunker called the road bunker. There are two fairway bunkers short of the green, the scholar's bunker about 56 yards away and the progressing bunker 35 yards from the edge of the green. Here's a 1910 diagram of the hole. Back then, the hotel didn't exist, but there were still buildings that blocked the tee shot and made it blind. You'll notice the green was in the same location, the road's in the same location. It was the same back in 1910 as it is today. Here's pretty much what it looked like back then. Hasn't changed much today, except the road to the right of the green has gotten narrower. Here's a more recent diagram of the hole, and you'll notice it's almost unchanged. The biggest change occurred in 1964 when the hole went from a short 464 yard par five into a long difficult par four. Thanks to a new back tee added by architect Martin Hawtrey in 2005, the hole now measures 495 yards with a tee that's actually not even on the old course property, but in the practice range next door. When the pin is on the back part of the green, it now plays as a 515 yard par four. While this is the longest par four on the course, Believe it or not, it has the smallest green, and it's an unusual green, consisting of two circles and a straight line. That straight line, of course, is the road, which is about four feet below the level of the green. And about eight paces on, it starts a transition rising up to a plateau of three feet above. This plateau flows to the back and flows away from the road. It's flat enough that that's where all the pin placements are, both for championship play and for member play. In the little neck of the green is that road hole bunker, just 13 feet wide and six feet deep. But since the ground around it funnels into the bunker, even from 10 or 15 yards away, you're gonna end up in the bunker. So it effectively acts as more like a 30 foot wide bunker than a 13 foot bunker. The difficulty with this transition slope for both approaches and putts is that it curves around and funnels down into the road hole bunker. The green measures 56 yards in length, but less than 20 yards in width. And since you're approaching the green on a diagonal, it's really a narrow target. The best way to play the road hole is to try to land your second shot short of the green and roll up, because if you hit the plateau on the fly, invariably you're gonna fly over, drop down into the road, and maybe even against up a rock wall that lines the far edge of the road. The oldest known diagram of the St. Andrews Lynx, which was known as Pilmore Lynx in those days, dates from 1810. It's very degraded down at the bottom, but you can see the details. It started at the town and went out to the River Eden, looped in, stopped, turned around, and came back. At this time, of course, these are still playing down single corridors to common putting surfaces at both ends so that golfers playing out and golfers coming in would intersect each other. It's hard to see, but our 17th hole those days was called the bridge hole because you would cross the Swelkin Bridge to reach the green. Most of the credit for, for designing the 17th green as it exists today, the little perched pedestal green with the pot bunker, is given to old Tom Morris, a club maker, greenkeeper, and pro. He's given credit mainly because in 1866, he built a new 18th green, and in 1870, he built a new first green over the Swoken Burn. The effect of that was to relieve the 17th green from having to serve double duty. It was no longer the first green, it was just the 17th. The next oldest map that exists of the old course at St. Andrews, it dates to 1875. It's pretty much the configuration that exists today. Our 17th hole is now listed as the Burn Hole, and as you look closely, this map shows several bunkers out there, each with an individual name. On the 17th, you can see a little tiny pot bunker about where the 17th green is. 
with a notation next to it, road. I don't know if that means that the bunker was called road at that time, or if a road from the Swilkin Burn still existed on that side of the hole. The other thing you'll notice on this map is the existence of a rail line going to a station next to the 17th fairway. This rail line was established in 1852. It had an immediate effect on the 17th hole, partly because that road ran by the green, now became the station road and had a lot more traffic going out to the railroad station. In those days, locomotives were run by steam fueled by coal. And this being the end of the line, this is where locomotives were refueled. So sheds were built to store that coal. And the people who built them obviously didn't consult with the golfers of St. Andrews because they built them right in the corner of the property in front of the 17th tees. These are the old black sheds, two peaked buildings that blocked the view of the fairway from the tee and intimidated golfers who had to hit over it. Legend has it that they were black because they stored coal, but in fact, they were tarred to keep them waterproof. That being the case, club makers in the town of St. Andrews began storing hickory in these sheds. So the black sheds soon became known as the drying sheds. It wasn't until 1911 that the area occupied by the old sheds was declared out of bounds. Curiously enough, the road running next to the 17th green has never been marked out of bounds. It's considered part of the golf course, so there's no relief if you hit on the pavement or up against the rock wall. In 1955, a British rail announced that it was closing the old course station and would replace it with a luxury hotel. They hoped to open it in time for the 1957 Open Championship at St. Andrews. But there were delays, and it actually took another decade before they finally built the hotel. In 1968, the old sheds came down and the old course hotel went up. So without the sheds, the tee shot seemed very simple because you could actually see what you were going to hit to. Soon after the hotel opened, the manager wanted the grounds walled off from golfers. So it was decided to fence it. Someone came up with the idea, since they were gonna put up a chain link fence in front of the tee at 17, to try to emulate the profile of the old black sheds. The idea was to give you something that you had to play over as it had been done for 100 years. But it was just a chain link fence so you could still see through it and see the fairway. When they played the 1970 British Open, the RNA officials felt that just wasn't right. And so they had a black mesh placed over the chain link fence. It wasn't quite blind, but it was certainly semi-blind. In 1984, the hotel decided to build some outbuildings and someone convinced them to make them replicas of the old black sheds. So the chain link fence went down and new sheds were erected. They're now green, not black, and they bear the words, Old Course Hotel. Now the tee shot is back to being totally blind. The road hole at St. Andrews is unique. It's one of a kind. A lot of golf architects have tried to replicate it. And in my opinion, every one of the efforts has failed. It's like trying to capture the voice of Sinatra. It just can't be done. No one can match the cadence or the timing. It's as much about the silk between the notes as the notes themselves. In my opinion, you shouldn't even try.